Thank you for joining us today. My name's Tannis, and uh, would you say hi? Let us know where you're watching from today online. We're in our last week of our Southgate United series, and this week is all about inspiring life around us. We're gonna invite you into our $10 challenge, and this money is going to Hope House in Odessa, Ukraine, and the work that World Hope is doing there to inspire life in Jesus in the girls and uh, the orphans in that community. So the ways to give are on the screen, and uh, we thank you for partnering with us. I have an update, last week's big give. You guys were so generous, and you gave nearly $40,000 towards our Southgate big give. Thank you for partnering with us. Part of inspiring life around us is doing things like Kidville at home, and our Kidville content is available Sundays at 7 a.m. Another at-home opportunity is our Southgate at Home boxes. We're gonna invite you guys to sign up, find your social bubble, following all of the provincial um, guidelines for safety, and do church in your home. Sign up online today. Before we listen to this song and do some worship, let's pray together. God, thank you um, for how your life impacts us so we can impact others and inspire others to a life with you. Would your Holy Spirit fill us today and uh, meet us where we are. In Jesus' name, amen. to be loved. 
During this time when church is just a click away, Southgate is staying united. United through teaching. United through worship. United through watch parties. United through campus launch meetings. United through baptisms. United through youth nights. United through stories. United through community. Through all of this, Southgate remains united through Jesus. So my name is Tyler Thompson. I've been attending Southgate for most of my life. Uh, my parents were with the Parkers in North Gore at the Cornerstone Wesleyan Church. And when the Parkers moved out to Kempville to start Southgate, we joined them. So I went to services at the South Gore Industrial Park as well as the Kempville College. And then so we also followed them obviously here and uh, onwards to Winchester as well. Yeah, so as I mentioned, I was like my family was part of the building crew of this original building at, in the Kempville location. And then once Winchester started up, I was very involved with like I joined Matt Gates, or I guess pastor at the time, out in that way, with that building crew, as well as was in Kempville. I joined uh, the greeting team. I was part of the Kidville with Lindsay, and went out in Winchester. I was part of the Kidville programming out there as well with uh, Melissa Gates. And that was a lot of fun. And now Westboro campus is started up with Pastor uh, Kevin, and so I'll be joining them out there as well as once we start, you know, working up again. <laughs> I love helping with Kivo because uh, the high energy that they bring, because like you get down there, like you're there early, but when they walk in the door, they're immediately like super energized, like energized, and they go out, they start playing games. Like they're super involved with learning about Christ, especially with uh, like the singing and the dancing. Like they're not, not just like, like you know, you're adult dancing, you're like full on kid dancing. <laughs> with uh, with COVID, I've le definitely learned to step back and sort of self-reflect with God. Because before I was, I was working at least two jobs at all the times, like you know, working, you know, 70 plus hours a week. And so now COVID, like, I had d got rid of my second job, and I've definitely toned down my like my my main job, my career, and I was able to really reflect and uh, talk with God a lot more personally. I've definitely learned to like take the times where I'm by myself, like especially in the car, because you know real estate you do a lot of driving. So I've learned to you know turn off the radio and just t you know pray out loud while I'm driving. Don't close your eyes, but <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've definitely learned to you know talk to talk to God whenever I do have a chance, whether it's in the morning or while I'm driving between showings or just on the way to the office, and take advantage of the time because he's always there to listen, right? Back like months ago, before COVID, uh, there was a call at, at church where it's like, write down this piece of paper if you feel calling to go anywhere. And I felt really called going into Ottawa. And I wrote that down and Pastor uh, Matt and Pastor Kevin met with me and we talked about the Westboro campus before it was even announced. And so I was really cool getting involved with that because I would love to bring the energy from Kidville, from Kempville, as well as Winchester and bring it to the kids in Westboro and bring that energy forward. Um, if I were to inspire someone to do something today, especially in the church, I recommend getting involved with either Kidville or Amped because seeing God through children's eyes is fantastic because they have a, such a, an awe towards it and like they have such, a, they bring such high energy to like lo looking at God and how they interact with him that it's just, for an adult, it's so like mind changing, right? All right, what a great, great video. I love these. I love hearing the stories of people and their lives and their, their connection to the church. Uh, so, so good. Now, uh, one of the things that I try to teach my boys, Emily and I, we are really big on uh, loving others through acts of kindness, all right? And so we try to instill this. We try to show it to our kids, whether it's wintertime and we're shoveling someone's driveway, whether it's uh, during the summer and we're sharing maybe some vegetables or dropping off uh, something at someone's house. It's something that we want our kids to see is really important. And, uh, and, and there's a reason that we do it, all right? We want to to display the love of Jesus to other people because when you do that, you're able to, you're able to, to, to kind of share things with them uh, at the same time or maybe later on when the need arises. Now, if, if we go back to the very beginning, I mean, the, the very earliest form of the church, which I always like to do, we, when Jesus returned to heaven, he left his followers with, with something called the Great Commission, all right? We've read this before, and, uh, and I want to share that with you to, to, today, all right? Let's, let's read this together. It's from Matthew 28, 18 to 20. It says this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the, and, uh, the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey 
everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so Jesus' followers, they're absolutely transformed by their faith in Jesus, all right? They're absolutely transformed. They are now called the church or, uh, or, or, or ecclesia. And that word ecclesia, it's, it's a Greek kind of word and, and, and it really means the assembling of, of people. So to assemble, it's a, it's a group of people. It's not an individual thing. It's a, it's a bunch of people who are gathered under God and uh, they're no longer individually following Jesus. They are collectively following him. They're doing this thing together. They're living in community. They're, 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 they're sharing with one another. They're learning together. And, uh, and they're entrusted at this point with the Great Commission. So oftentimes the Great Commission, when we think about it and we read scriptures like that, it, it really what we think about is evangelism. You know, just going to the, to the far reaches of the world and, and, and we're going to share the good news of Jesus. We're going to share what he's done in our lives. We're going to, to talk about it. We're going to tell stories. We're going to proclaim it from the rooftops. And really what we think about is evangelism only. But an examination of the early church in the book of Acts, we find not only does that happen, but something else happens. In fact, in the book of Acts, they are entrusted with carrying on the ministry of Jesus. All right, that's what they're entrusted with. And Jesus' ministry, yeah, it included evangelism, but it was, it was far more than just trying to win people for the kingdom. It included healing, right? It included uh, doing life together. It was addressing the needs in the community, uh, they, they, whether they were part of the church or not, right? It was looking after the poor and, and the orphans and, and the widows and and it was establishing God's kingdom. It was, it was bringing peace and justice and reconciliation, right? It was these things that they were entrusted with, not just winning people for the kingdom of God. See, what, what turned this little group, this, this, this ecclesia, this, this collective of people under God, what, what changed in their life to make them unstoppable, incredibly dynamic? What helped them and pushed them forward to, to, to be this crazy force for Jesus? You see, they witnessed Jesus' death, but not only that, they witnessed Jesus' resurrection. They saw him die, and then they saw him live. And the disciples' faith took on new significance, new, new power when they witnessed this take place because they realized this is for real. See, they lived with him for three years. They, they followed him. They, they, they watched him. They interacted with him. They, they, they were like a sponge for three years. And to cap it all off, they watched him resurrect See, this new church was empowered, it was invigorated, and they were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, the, the resurrected Jesus told them he was going to leave them with something. He was going to leave them with a, with a comforter, with, with, with a power source, with, with something that would help them continue on this mission that he had called them to. In fact, we see that in Acts chapter 1, 4, and 5. It says this, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with water the Holy Spirit. It's, it's new significance and new power. You see the same group of followers who felt really terrified, who were, who were fearful and, and felt defeated just, just, just a few weeks before as they watched their teacher, their rabbi, Jesus, as they watched him got beaten and, and die, they felt like it was over. They, they felt like they couldn't go on. And this same group emerged as a, as a courageous force. In dynamic force, right? This powerful community, while they continued to, to, to face the same kind of persecution that Jesus did. And so once fearful, they are able to, to do things they could never do before. They're unstoppable, no matter the obstacles that come in their path. 
See, the book of Acts shows us the uncommon virtues of the early church. The book of Acts highlights this group of believers, this ecclesia, what they're able to do and and the virtues that they held, right? Things like they had a love and deep care for one another as they did life together. They had a a high sense of calling with which they were not going to stop. They were determined to carry through it. They displayed extreme generosity and they had uh, compelling courage, right? They had a unity that could not be broken. There were the virtues that they carried with them, the the values as the ecclesia. They proclaimed the gospel. They, they, They displayed signs and wonders. It was an amazing time. And it really revolutionized and ended up changing the entire Roman Empire. The entire Roman Empire would eventually change. And so, and so if you know this, maybe you know it or not, but there are six key factors that change the Roman Empire from this ecclesia, from this, from this group of believers. And, and I've kind of written them down here for you. In the, in the Roman Empire, this is how it changed that, that entire structure. See, the early church taught that there is a God who loves everybody unconditionally, no matter what right? Number two, since this God loves humanity and demonstrates his love through sacrifice, Christians must love and serve others as well, all right? And so replicating that way that God loves us. Number three, in the early church, there were, there were no distinctions of hierarchy between class or ethnicity or, or gender among believers. Everyone was equal, right? Every, it, was a, it was an equal playing field and that people were important no matter, no matter who they were, right? And number four, the church taught Christian men to love their wives and children as themselves. Revolutionary in that time, all right? And number five, followers of Jesus taught that God is a merciful God who requires mercy. And in the Roman Empire, mercy is not really a thing, right? It's not really a thing. And so this is revolutionary to hear this. And number six, finally, Christian work is not a curse, but a calling. Even going back a few weeks ago and talking about serving others, right? It's a, it's a calling. And even just last week, hearing that we have a responsibility to follow through with what God is leading individually us to do. And we got we to gotta accept that and move forward with it. See, that was the early church. It changed the whole Roman Empire. But now, now we have governments in place all around Western culture and really all around the world. But specifically in Western culture, during our pandemic, it seems like the government is the one who, who comes alongside people, who, who, who shares the promise of, of, of never leaving you, who, who puts out bailout packages and, and finance packages to help people along in their distress and their anxiety and financial kind of, kind of you know, worries. And, and they come alongside and, uh, and, and we wonder to ourselves, is there even a role in this time for the church, for the ecclesia, for, for, for the, the, the group who are gathering or who can't even gather right now? Do we have a role in this? See, when Jesus walked among us, he had the He had the option of establishing a government. He could have gone that route. He could have established himself as a king and a ruler and and, and to rule over everyone and establish different forms of government and to overhaul the Roman Empire at the time in that kind of way, but he didn't do that. He decided to do and to take a different approach. He established the church. And he said that the gates of hell will not overcome it. The church, the ecclesia. Listen, the church, the church is more than an institution. The church is you. The church is me. We are the collective church. We are the ecclesia. We we are the ones who, who Jesus left his ministry to to follow through with it, to join him. We're a collection of individuals who form the global church and we're commissioned to do so. And so what does that look like? Well, here's here's really, as we read Jesus and we read about him in the Bible, we find that Jesus really came to join people. 
to walk among them, to live among them. And that's, in my ministry, that's what I found is real important. Like I mentioned at the beginning, whether it's shoveling in someone else's driveway or mowing their lawn or delivering a meal or, 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 or joining them at the birth of a child or, or whatever it is, loving other people and joining them in their life is something that Jesus lived out. The, the example of this in my life and even in the life of our church is is, is the mission work that we do in Ukraine with Hope House, right? And so I have a few pictures from, uh, from our time in Hope House. I mean, this is me doing the chicken dance. It's absolutely ridiculous, right? I'm doing the chicken dance, and uh, you're like, well, this is not missions work. This is, uh, you're, you're going on a missions trip halfway around the world, and you're doing a, a stinking chicken dance here. But, I mean, this is, this is part of it. It's, it's doing, it's joining people in what God is already doing in their lives, right? Or we have a few other pictures. This is Sergey and Larissa, and they are doing incredible work as a host mom and dad for, for orphaned girls, right? And providing them a safe place to learn and to grow, to show them dignity and love and hope. And they've dedicated their entire lives, even adopting some girls themselves, Right? They're already doing great things. I don't need to go there and start something new. I just need to join them in what God is already doing, living among them, right? These are some kids at the orphanage, one of the orphanages that we went to, and they're just having a blast because they're absolutely loved, right? They know they're accepted. They know that they're loved. They know that they are cared for. We have another picture, you know, just sharing some kvass, and uh, I won't even tell you what this stuff is, but, but we're just eating, right? We're sharing a meal together, and uh, the next picture here, I think we're making, some, we're making some poutine, which they'd never had, and they thought it was disgusting anyways, but we were making this, and it's just, you go somewhere, and you think you're going to, you're going you're gonna to do something great, that there's this big thing that I'm going to do, and I'm going to let people know about the good news, but the reality is, is that what Jesus did is he just joined people in life. He lived among them. It's the story of Christmas even. It's the story of Jesus coming into the world as a baby. And pastors have written sermons, tons of sermons about this. Hymn writers have, have, have written a whole bunch of songs about this, reflected on the significance of of what it means for, that Jesus came in the form of a baby, that Jesus was born in the flesh, and that he came and lived among us, that he joined us in our lives. He met with people in crowds, or, or, or specifically one-on-one -on -one in, in person, and his primary focus was, was, was forming relationships. It wasn't a task that he was coming to do. It was relationships with people, joining them in their lives. It, it was representation that God is not distant, that he is, he is with us, right? No other institution specializes in proximity, proximity discipleship like the local church. The church ought to be the one who comes alongside people, who, who joins people. And we've heard the old African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, but listen, it, it, it takes a church to disciple a person, a true disciple of Jesus, it takes a whole church to come alongside someone, right? And to love them and to help them grow and to care for them, right? And so I, I know that there's this struggle in the church world or as believers, how, how do we join people? I mean, how, how do we live out the Great Commission? How, how do we do this? Is it, is, it, is it on one hand, is it just about doing good, good works and, and delivering like pizzas or, or shoveling someone's driveway or looking after widows and, and orphans? Is, is that kind of what we do? Is that, is that what it's all about? Is that the focus? Or is it, on the other hand, is it the gospel and sharing the gospel and, and preaching the word of God and shouting it from the rooftops and, and saying, you know what? Jesus died for you and he resurrected for, for you and you have the opportunity to, to have new life. Is, what, what, what is the real purpose of the church? Some people in some churches, they're too afraid to be evangelical, right? Kind of speaking out and, and going out into public and letting people know about the good news. They don't really want to do that. Instead, what they'd rather do is focus on good works rather than the good news. And in other churches, they're all about the good news and the teaching and, and the discipleship. It's just the core of what they do. And it's just bam, bam, bam. We're going to go deeper, 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 deeper. But they don't do anything that involves good works, right? 
And so what are, those two, what are those two definitions? I think the definition here of good news is, is people who, who are preaching, who are listening, who are proclaiming that Jesus died, he's forgiven people of their sin, he resurrected, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, and you have the opportunity to have eternal life, right? To do 180, to unite your life with him. That is the good news. The good works, the definition there is, is really... God's concern for justice and reconciliation is to, to kind of to kind of do and help people and humanity, right? And so which one is more important? See, I think they're I think they go hand in hand here. They're together in this. Good works is a consequence of good news. Right? Good works is a consequence of good news. The good news is the means by which God brings people to birth, but because of that, because I've united my life with Jesus, because I've done that, I I want to do things for other people. I want to love on them. I I want to help them out, no matter who they are, right? Secondly, good works is a bridge for good news. It's a bridge, right? It helps me to be able to share with other people. I know when I moved here to Canada, right, People, people, I realized that the culture was very different than when I was, where I was in New York and, and people were not as trusting of the church here in Ontario and they kind of looked down maybe a little bit on the church and they're skeptical about it. And I realized at that time, Southgate needs to be a place that people can trust. And, and the way that you do that is you love people and you provide for them and you do things for them and you be a part of the community. You join people in your community, they're more likely to listen to what you have to say, Right? Even Jesus lived this out. He would often perform a good work or a miracle before he shared the good news. He would often do one before the other, right? Because it just, it's logical, just makes sense. And then thirdly, good, good works accompanies good news. Good works accompanies good news. They are together in this. They're like two wings of a bird, right? They're, 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 they're kind of both together. With, they, need, they need each other, right? Two blades of a, of a pair of scissors. They need each other to be effective and the most effective of what God wants to do through them. You see, the bottom line is that our actions must match our words. They have to both be the same. See, James 2, 14 to 18, reads like this. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or or sister is without clothes and daily food. If if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? is it? What good is it? See, in the same way, faith by itself, if, if it's not accompanied by action, it's, it's dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. I will show you my faith by my deeds. See, there's a famous, famous saying that goes, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. And I think that's really important in a pandemic. Uh, Pastor Kevin lent me this book, and uh, there's, a, there's a great quote in here uh, from, uh, from Luther. And I want you to, to just like listen to this. It's from 1527, all right? He's going through, there's a plague at the time, very similar situation to what we are going through. And here is what Luther says in regards to it. With God's permission, the enemy has sent poison and deadly dung among us. And so I will pray to God that he may be gracious and preserve us. Then I will fumigate to purify the air, give and take medicine, and avoid places and persons where I am not needed in order that I may not abuse myself, and that through me others may not be infected and inflamed, with the result that I become the cause of their death through my negligence. If God wishes to take me, he will be able to find me. At least I have done what he gave me to do, And I am responsible neither for my own death nor for the death of others. But listen, but if my neighbor needs me, I shall avoid neither person nor place, but feel free to visit and to help them. 
See, that's what I'm saying here. There are opportunities to inspire life in other people. And, and I, know, I know we're in a difficult situation. I know we are in the pandemic. I, I know, but Luther is, is living this out way back in the 1500s, right? He's, he, he's living this thing out and he says, no matter what, I will still serve. And no matter what, I will still share. No matter what, I will still do what God has called me to do. To live with people. To do life together. And to be the ecclesia. To inspire life in other people. Let's check out what the next steps are for this week. Here's what I wrote down for, for us to kind of take hold of with this teaching. I just want you to take the step to share good works with someone today to inspire life in others. I don't know what it is, right? It, it, could, it could be really anything. It could, be, it could be kind of going over to your neighbor and, and picking up sticks that blew down in a storm. It, it could be baking some muffins and, and delivering them to a neighbor just with a little note and putting it on their, on their step. It could be paying for the person behind you or in front of you in, in the uh, drive through line. It could, be, it could be putting a great tip on someone who cut your hair or at a restaurant. It could be any of those things. But what could you do to display good works with someone to inspire life in them? Number two. Find the courage to share the good news with someone you shared good works with. So maybe you've been helping someone, you've been coming alongside them for a long time, you've joined with them or in their life, and maybe you've been doing that for days or weeks or months or maybe even years, but you've never ever shared the good news with them. T take a moment, find the courage, just like the Ecclesia of the book of Acts that Jesus called them to this great commission, just share the story of what God has done in your life. The reason for your good works, right? And number three, we're challenging everyone today to be a part of the Inspire, this Inspire Challenge. $10, this is kind of what we're doing for our minimum. If you wanted to give $10, all the money today is going to the work in Ukraine, all right? With World Hope International, all right? And so Hope House is working with this program and, and joining them in what God is already doing. And we're saying kind of a minimum here of 10. If you want to give more, if you feel led to give more, you can do that and press into what God is calling us to do and joining people around the world. A pandemic can't stop what God wants to do, right? All right, would you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. God, um, the challenge is, is, is so obvious here. As you kind of ascend uh, and you leave your church, the ecclesia, this group of people with the great commission here, and you, you, you challenge us, you, you, you tell us, continue the ministry that I've started. Step in and step up to what what you're, calling, what you're calling us to do. God, I, we, we want to be those people. We want to be your ecclesia. And even though maybe we can't gather as a large group like we, like we once were and once did, God, we can, we can assemble in multiple places, in multiple locations, God, that we can still be that ecclesia, that we can still do good works and proclaim the good news for your glory and your kingdom. And so, Father, help us to inspire life in others, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So don't forget to take part in our $10 challenge and be part of inspiring life um, all across the world together. See you next week.